Okay, welcome everyone to the uh, second session in the communications EPO track uh, this morning. Uh, we have a, another a great session, uh, including uh, panelists that will be talking to us about the role of the major and mid-scale research infrastructure in fueling the U.S. STEM workforce pipeline. Uh, the focus of this session is really going to be on um, pre-K through 12 and informal uh, education. And also, um, this afternoon, we'll have a second session that really focuses on undergraduate students and graduate students and the role that the large facilities can play in, um, in, in uh, promoting a strong STEM uh, workforce. So uh, this session, like I said, we'll, we'll focus on, on pre-K through 12. But we have this morning here with us, uh, some of these folks are virtual. Uh, Sue Ann Heatherly, who is from the Green Bank Observatory. We have Car uh, Carlos Villa, who is the Director of K-12 Education Programs at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. We have Valerie Bogan, uh, who is the Curriculum Specialist to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And we have um, John Rithvi, uh, who is the Director of the Center for Science Education, University, uh, University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. And John is here with us in, in person this morning. So. Uh, if there's tomatoes or things like that you're going to throw, it's only it's only going to be John that's that's going to get hit. So, <laughs> but anyways, I really want to thank uh, everyone for for being here uh, this morning and for the excellent panel that we are about to hear from. And so we'll we'll start off with Valerie. Uh, Valerie, you're up. All right, thank you. I'm happy to be there here with you this morning. Um, as Tim said, I am based at. Charlottesville, Virginia at NREO. And I believe that as these research institutions, we can play a great role in the STEM pipeline. The first step that we can do is just providing content knowledge to, to teachers. Because today, teachers need support. Many of the teachers are teaching in disciplines in which they're not licensed. So they don't have the content knowledge to be able to create or even implement lessons on many STEM topics. And so we need to provide them content knowledge in a safe and supportive environment. This past summer, NRAO hosted a summer research um, session for teachers. They spent six weeks virtually learning about the electromagnetic spectrum. They attended workshops presented by EM spectrum experts from a variety of industries, including radio astronomy and media radar. After those sessions, they then took the knowledge that they had gained and worked as a community to create lessons based on, on the knowledge. This was a supportive environment and the teachers were very supportive in what they got from it. And I thought it was a good experience for them. Some potential ways to add to this, I would like to take the videos that we recorded from the summer sessions and create an asynchronous professional development so that teachers nationwide who were not able to participate this past summer will still have access to this knowledge and will be able to use the lessons that were created. The second thing we can do is provide access to these content-based lessons. The lessons we provide to teachers need to be engaging, they need to be inquiry-based, and they need to use the standards that the teachers are expected to use in their classrooms. At NRAO, we have made great strides into creating a curriculum catalog for our teachers. We currently have nine lessons, which will be available to teachers nationwide within the next month. I've written those lessons myself. Three of them provide the basic knowledge on the EM spectrum that we found students are lacking, and six of them are inquiry lessons, which allow students to explore the EM spectrum and specifically radio frequencies using an RTL SDR dongle. The other 20 lessons were created by our teachers this summer, and those are currently being piloted and will be available within the next year. All of the lessons will be cataloged on Supernova. This is uh, the website that we use at NREO. This will allow teachers to access the lessons. They can look by grade level. They'll be able to look by topic. 
And these lessons will be easily downloadable so that they can use them in their classrooms. The third thing that we need to do is provide students an opportunity to explore STEM disciplines. And NRAO is doing a fantastic job at this. We have several programs available to students. We have a citizen science project, which is being released nationwide. This project allows students to again use an RTL SDR dongle to explore the radio frequencies around them. Another opportunity we have is called the ham radio course and it's starting in January. This course will allow high school students to learn not only about ham radio and eventually get a license in ham radio, but they're also going to be exposed to other aspects of the EM spectrum so that they can know what type of information is included and possibly what careers they could pursue within the EM spectrum or ham radio. What I would like to do in the future is add to our offerings. Currently, I'm developing some undergraduate courses that are all EM spectrum based. I'd like to take those courses and turn them into digital badges that high school students could access. And then they could take these short courses on topics such as spectrum management, and then decide if they're interested in pursuing that as a potential career in the future. Lastly, we just need to expose students to the possible careers. Unfortunately, teachers and guidance counselors are overburdened with things that they're expected to do. And so they don't have enough time to spend explaining to students about all the possible careers they could pursue. So we need to fill that need. NREO is just getting started. Um, we had the workshops this summer during that some, the teacher program that I told you about. And during those workshops, our industry experts not only explained to the teachers about what they did on a day-to-day -day basis, but also about their careers and the, how they got to the place that they are today. So that information now can be passed on by those teachers to their own students. We need to add to this um, in the future. I would like to create a guide that is accessible on Supernova to teachers and students alike that would allow students to search through the careers within the radio frequency spectrum. Let them see the careers that are available, the courses that they need to take, the colleges that or universities that would provide the majors that they need. The EPO department at NRAO has gotten a start creating some videos which seek, um, feature our employees and how they've gotten their start. I would like to add to those to give the students the exposure to potential careers and hopefully help them enter the STEM workforce. Thank you. And we are now gonna, going to move on to uh, Carlos uh, Villa. Uh, and he will be, be, again be presenting remotely. Um, hey everybody, my name is Carl Sarvia. I'm the Director of K-12 Education Programs at the National Magnet Lab. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Magnet Lab, we are one of seven magnetic field labs in the world, the only ones on this hemisphere and the largest and highest powered magnet lab in the world. Um, and the big question that I always get asked by everybody that comes to us is, do you do anything other than magnets? And yes, 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 we do. Uh, in fact, the number one thing that we do is materials research um, and everything else kind of rolls into that physics, engineering, chemistry, bio, biology, biomedical, geochem. Um, it basically, we do a little bit of everything here. Now, I'm gonna take you all on a little journey um, in, through our local community and give you the experience of what students in our um, community get to experience being in Tallahassee with the Magnet Lab in their backyard. And it starts with a K-12 classroom outreach. And what we do um, is we do field trips at the Magnet Lab, bringing kids to the lab to be able to see all these things. But also we go out to the schools that can't come out to us and we do activities there um, and just kind of give them a quick uh, summary, uh, an activity, and get them excited about science, get them a good feeling, uh, and just build up their, their confidence just a little bit. So a field trip to the lab is only two hours, and during these, these two hours, they will get a tour of the facility and a chance to do an activity and learn about um, electromagnetism and materials research. Now, 
in addition to the classroom outreach, we also do a lot of informal education in the community. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is the Halloween science programs that we do. Um, and we invite students out to come in here with their families, do some science, do some fun. Uh, and again, just get them excited about STEM and about the Magnet Lab. Um, even tonight, we're doing Science Night at the library. So we're constantly doing activities in our community so that they see the MagLab brand and get to do some science. Now, early in, in the K-5 experience, these students only get us for a short moment. They get to come to the lab for two hours or I go to their classroom for one hour. Um, and it's, it's very quick, but then they get an opportunity to join us for summer camps at the lab. And the summer camps at the lab are a week long um, and we offer two summer camps where we bring students out to the lab. We have, of course, our Sci Girls program, which is our partnership with um, WFSU and the Sci Girls television show that is aired out of um, TPT in Minnesota. Uh, I'm sorry, in yeah, St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, and then we have the MagLab Camp Tesla, which is our co-ed program to invite boys and girls into the lab to do science together. Um, both of them are here, held here at the lab, about 25 to 50 kids each year. Um, and it gets them a little bit more exposure to the Magnet Lab. Instead of just a one hour tour, they get 30 minutes in each different lab throughout the entire week. And then we do an activity based off of what that lab is researching. So this is a little bit of a longer term exposure to the lab. And at this point, we're kind of excited. We got them hooked. Um, and of course, I wanna say that we started our Sci Girls Camp in 2006. Sci, uh, camp Tesla started in 2011. And we also offer Sci Girls Coding Camp which is a partner with one of our um, local Title I schools. Now, once we've got them through the summer camp, we tell them about our middle school mentorship program. And that program is actually starting for us this week. And in the middle school mentorship program, these students get to come out to the lab and actually have a research experience. So I've got four groups of students over the last 10 years that I'm highlighting here. And you can see some of the projects that they've been working on. These aren't little pep projects. These aren't little um, science fair projects like what battery lasts the longest in the flashlight or any of that. Um, simulation and structure of function of carbon nanotubes. That was about seven years ago. Um, and I know that because the girl in the red shirt, that's Mahetsi Martinez. And she is a senior in high school right now. And I just talked to her yesterday about possible fields to go into um, when she starts her university studies. Um, next over, using carbon isotopes to identify high fructose corn syrup and honey samples. That was done with our geochemistry lab. And you see two students there on top of the um, ionically coupled plasma mass spectrometer machine. Um, Pizzo and pyroelectricity and Rochelle salts, those two students up there. Um, and at the bottom in our ICR lab, that's ion cyclotron resonance. Extraction, isolation, and molecular characterization of organic T compounds. So this is a semester-long program. These students get a chance to really do research hand-in-hand um, -hand with the scientists. They get to run the machines. And this is only um, 10 weeks, three hours each day, um, every once a week, I should mention. Um, but it gives them a little bit more of an opportunity to get into the Magnet Lab and really start to do their research now. Um, here's another pro, uh, poster, and at the end of the program, we have a poster session. So this is one of the posters that we've had, extraction and analyses of dissolved organic matter from local water bodies. Uh, and this was from two years ago. So this is a fairly new uh, project that they were able to do. Once they finish their middle school mentorship, we want to get them into the high school externship. And the high school externship is the full academic year. Students are expected to come out twice a year and actually work um, with their scientists. And this program has been blossoming recently. And so this is a more in-depth, um, again, each step progressing a little bit deeper. And in this project, uh, this is last year's project, superconducting tape respooler and retensioner machine. And this was done with our magnet science and technology team. And this was a high school student, um, Audrey Wright, from one of our local high schools here. Uh, I want to show you one more poster from the high school externship, and that is determining the role of biofluids on Pseudomonas argu arginosa motility. Uh, and this was two students actually working together. Um, if you look up there, Gabby Bynum's one of the students. Uh, I like to highlight her because she was one that did the summer camp. She did middle school mentorship. She's done high school externship, and now she's at university level. The dream is to get them now at the undergraduate level to either come back to lab as an intern or 
um, as an REU student. So what do students say about our programs? This is one of my favorite slides, I, and I'm so excited to share this with you. Um, this is Natasha Menon. She was in the middle school mentorship program in 2008. Uh, and this is a picture of her from 2008 working on an electron microscope here at the Mag Lab. Now, this is a picture of her this year working with her biomedical samples uh, as she is a PhD candidate in microbiology now. So um, she sends a quote that I want to share with you all. And she says that um, I was part of the middle school mentorship that used to come to the Mag Lab way back in the day. I'm currently a PhD candidate working on antibiotic resistance, so mostly microbiology. But I recently had to send some samples off for some electron microscopy. And I remember saying to my major professor, quote, the last time I had to do anything with an electron microscope was in middle school. The look on my major professor's face was priceless. So I love that they had that opportunity to be able to say, oh yeah, electron microscopy, I did that in sixth grade. Um, so that's something that's really cool. I'm gonna highlight one more student I have with uh, the time I have left, and that's Mati McKinney. This is her in 2011 in our um, Tesla summer camp. Um, Mati graduated from Spelman College, magna cum laude. She's currently a PhD candidate in mathematics at Harvard. Uh, and what she said was, um, and actually I wanna to jump to this too. Um, this is her high school volunteer log and she wrote, from my many experiences at the Mag Lab, I was able to discover um, more about the different careers and fields I could go into one day as a scientist. I also gained a more in-depth perspective on what being a scientist is all about. Um, I felt this sums up the significance of your impact on my STEM philosophy pretty well. So that's how the Mag Lab was able to contribute to her. And this is her undergraduate honors thesis on the social insect behavior. Um, and this is what she did as an undergraduate years ago, because now she's a PhD candidate at Harvard. So um, I wanted to show you that a, a typical path, what our dream is to get these students through our K-12 programs, and then uh, hopefully snag them for the um, REU program and undergraduate studies. So uh, I want to finish with a quote that I always end all of my programs and presentations with, and that is to tell everyone to stay nerdy, stay geeky, stay true to who you are, be kind to others because science is an activity for everyone. So thank you. And Tim, I turn it back over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Carla. So it was a great presentation. Um, and I think what we'll do is, is we're gonna go to John here uh, next. And then we'll be doing Sue Ann, correct? Okay, we're good. John, all yours. Thank you, Tim. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here, uh, those in the room and, of course, online. Uh, I'm going to, my name is John Ristvi from uh, the UCAR Center for Science Education, and it's my pleasure today to talk about one of the projects that we have in UCAR SciEd called STEM Career Connections. And uh, this is a, a uh, as it relates to our theme today, uh, looking at the major and mid-scale research infrastructure for career a U.S. STEM workforce, I'd like to, to propose uh, a model that we've uh, been studying in the STEM Career Connections project as something that could be adapted for others to use in our space. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, that this work is in the third year of, of a three-year project uh, funded by the National Science Foundation ITEST program. And I'd like to also acknowledge the, the many partners we have with, in this project. Uh, first of all, uh, University of Colorado Boulder, uh, Utah State University, and uh, the local partners that we have uh, in the uh, Colorado uh, Mountain community where we're doing this work. There we go. You have to really push the green button. Uh, so these are some of the goals of the project as we've uh, done this over the last couple of years, uh, really to explicitly connect classroom learning uh, with real world examples in STEM careers. Uh, building partnerships uh, to support students with mentors. And that's, again, where uh, we can have some participation from scientists at our, our facilities uh, and professional networks to bridge equity gaps. And a uh, combination of our curriculum, the STEM mentors, and the career experiences to stimulate uh, youth interest. And really, in our project,
project, we're looking at each of those three components that are illustrated in this uh, triangle diagram to see how we can combine them in order to impact uh, youth interests, but also uh, help them see themselves in, in a pathway uh, towards a STEM career. Uh, so in this diagram, I'd like to start at the bottom right corner. Our uh, colleagues and partners at, at CU Boulder have developed a, a couple of different technology curriculums that we've used uh, for this project. And as was mentioned in the previous talk, uh, we've been careful to uh, make sure that we've used um, align our, our materials and build them toward the next generation science standards to support uh, students in their learning. Uh, we've also um, used a, a storyline uh, approach that uses local phenomena to, to gauge students' interest over time. Uh, we use that STEM curriculum in partnership with communities, and we use uh, the community, local community in uh, rural Colorado, mountain community in Eagle County to uh, develop partnerships with different STEM professionals and organizations within that community to serve as mentors uh, working with students in their projects. And then finally, in the, in the lower left corner, the integrated career experiences, we work with the career guidance counselor in the district to align what we're doing and to integrate the existing career activities that are happening in the schools with uh, the student experiences. And I'll show some examples of that. So this is a sort of a, a year in the life of our project, if you will, and I'm not going to read or go over this in detail, but our project works, as I mentioned before, with middle school youth uh, from low income families and both in school in out of school settings and in summer programming in a rural mountain community in Colorado. And in the first quarter, we worked very closely with the, the uh, career counselor, district career counselor, and focusing on global ready skills that the district has put into place. And so how can we take those skills that the students are learning in their other classes and integrate those into our curriculum and into our mentoring experiences? Second quarter, we, we really, built and adapted uh, lessons that are career-based lessons using individual career and academic plans, which are they're called ICAP here in Colorado, uh, to use uh, to help students see how this work ties in with their other goals that they've been working on. Quarter three, we integrated the sensor immersion curriculum, which is one of the two uh, technology curricula that I talked about in the previous slide, and uh, integrated that with the career lessons. And then in the fourth quarter, we added the Entering portion of the work uh, where the students would work on projects that use the sensors uh, and, and had interactions with mentors that could help them uh, understand their problem, ask questions, and also to be able to uh, share a little bit of their career pathway experiences as well. And then finally, we put all of this together in a, a week-long summer uh, experience uh, working with our partners there. That, uh, so we adapted all four of these uh, components into the summer programming. And uh, this past summer, we did it over the course of four weeks instead of one week. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about the, the uh, technology curriculum and I, uh, very quickly, I wanted to uh, share with you the, the examples of the, the work that the youth work on. They use micro bits and gator bits from uh, SparkFun Electronics, a local uh, company here in Colorado. And that, that these uh, gator bits and micro bits connect with environmental sensors. And then the youth use make code, which is a simple block code uh, programming uh, so that the youth can develop a system to study a uh, local problem or something of interest from their local community. Uh, we also, when I mentioned we integrated uh, career resources from the, the district level, uh, we adapted an activity uh, using a, a career card sort and career wall so that the youth can de develop their own operational definition of what a STEM career is versus careers that use STEM. And one of the things we learned over the past summer from our teachers and our youth that participated in the program was that while many, there are many STEM opportunities out there, STEM career opportunities locally that they learned about from their mentors, they also learned that 
through interviewing uh, community heroes is what we call them, that many, many, many of the other careers that are not necessarily considered STEM careers use STEM and what they do in their everyday work experience. So we, we started with a career card sort activity. They use that operational definition to post it on a career wall. And then as they did their community hero interviews, they added those examples from their local community to the board. Uh, and then fi uh, finally with uh, doing a, a an individual career uh, assessment called My Next Move, they added career opportunities that they were interested in in the wall as well. Here's a, a quick uh, picture of what a template looked like that the youth looked at to help build uh, their career wall as they did their interviews, as they did their My Next Move activities. Uh, this slide shows some of the interactions between the youth and the mentors. Uh, we primarily recruited mentors from, uh, from the local community in Eagle County, but we also recruited mentors here at NCAR. Uh, the mentors met with the students three times during the school year and then during the week of the summer camp in the summer, as well as in, during the after school programs. And uh, they focused on their careers and skills each time, as well as working with the, the youth on the sensors and the projects and what the work was that they were doing in class. Uh, obviously, when we started this work three years ago, uh, we had some programming challenges due to COVID. And so we had to implement virtual mentors, which had challenges, but also provided opportunities for uh, mentors from other areas to be involved. And you can see on the, on the slide that we um, looked at how mentors could connect with the projects. So we recruited mentors that could speak to the types of work that the youth were doing with sensors, uh, sharing their career path opportunities, letting the youth and students ask questions related to their interests and, and their own career paths, and to help them work together, the mentors and the youth to brainstorm real world applications of what they were doing. And then the youth had practice explaining their ideas and communicating with the mentors. Uh, this slide, I'm not going to read it to you. I, uh, I think that's, it's, that would be not fun, but uh, this is just some of the uh, names of the, of the scientists that we had here from NCAR that participated in our project over the last few years. Um, this uh, shows really that the NCAR scientists as mentors showed interest in, in designing projects um, that use programmable sensors to monitor air quality in their communities and either in the classroom or in the hallway or even the students to drop off and pick up areas in schools. So in, in the outside of the school during the pickup time, uh, the youth were most interested in carbon dioxide levels and also talked uh, with their mentors about using temperature and soil moisture and sound sensors to detect wildfires uh, that had started uh, if the conditions were right for possible wildfires, which was a, has been a, an issue here in Colorado. Uh, finally, um, I have listed here uh, some examples of promising practices of what we've learned from our project over the last couple of years. Um, first of all, really learning about the STEM ecosystem in the community is critical. Uh, this includes learning about the local STEM related businesses and forming relationships with these businesses with local STEM focused educational organizations, uh, aligning with community partners who share these goals. And this really helped us approach and engage STEM professionals as mentors. Uh, we held informational meetings and professional development with the mentors prior to the first student experience. And this uh, served as a meet and greet between the teachers and the mentors uh, and the larger research team. Uh, this also helped to provide support to instructors around logistics, such as timing, group structure, technical support for the instructors, and uh, providing support to the mentors around youth engagement and allowing them to work together to think about types of questions and how they can share their own experiences around career pathways. And the, asking the students to come up with questions ahead of time uh, to ask their mentors in advance. So we, I have a, a one page uh, document that uh, more explains this that I've, I've submitted and is part of the conference website if you're interested in that. 
Finally, I just want to say thank you. Uh, my contact information is here if you have questions about this project or this approach. Uh, much better than me talking about it is we uh, did a STEM for All video, so you can hear directly from the teachers and the youth that have participated in our project, so check that link out. And then if you're interested in the school-wide labs uh, sensor curriculum, that's also part of the one pager that I submitted uh, as part of the, the project. So future work will include a partnership toolkit, which is basically taking all of the lessons learned that we've done uh, in this project over the last two or three years and develop tools, templates, strategies, and examples of how you could replicate this in your own local uh, situation. And then a curriculum resource pack where we take the curriculum and add those three pieces to uh, the curriculum so that it's an integrated approach. I want to thank you for your time and look forward to hearing your questions. Okay, thank you, John. I, I think it's it's great to have these these projects where kids are actually actually building the instruments and and then actually using them to to collect data. I think that that uh, that just uh, makes the experience more meaningful and certainly exposes them to, you know, the broader sort of. Um, uh, STEM uh, ecosystem, as you described. So we are going to move on to Sue Ann Heatherly, who's at Green Bank Observatory. Sue Ann, it's all yours. Thank you. I hope I can manage to stay on. <laughs> and John Ristby, it is so good to see you, man. I enjoyed your presentation. So uh, today I'm going to be talking also uh, in the same vein as Carlos a little bit about research and its uh, potential value in uh, developing the K through 13 um, STEM pipeline. We are at the Green Bank Observatory as a facility um, funded by the National Science Foundation. Research happens here. And so this is a strength that we want to bring to uh, students all along their pathway. Um, in 2013, this was published in Science Magazine. This article was published in Science Magazine that is my guiding framework for uh, what we do here at the observatory. Um, this was an article talking about college student persistence in STEM, um, but it really highlighted the importance of um, developing early interest and science identity as a powerful mechanism for persistence. And so I take this with me in about everything that I do um, with students regarding research experiences. So uh, in our activities that we do here at the observatory, um, conducting research is a key component along with mentoring, not only from scientists, but from uh, folks a little bit farther along the pathway than the students themselves. And the idea is to build this network and this community of students that will serve them well as they move forward on the path. So the things that I'm gonna um, highlight today are in black. I'm not gonna talk about REU experiences or undergraduate experiences, but um, I'm gonna talk about some immersion experiences that we do here at the observatory all the way up through that transition between high school and undergraduate school. So we have programs for grade five up and then middle to high school transition is a big place for us. And then we have uh, sort of a high school to undergraduate transition program as well. So um, we, we think here at the observatory that these uh, research um, um, opportunities that we give students should uh, have these characteristics that you see here on this slide. And we recently had back in the spring, a wonderful workshop bringing together people. Carlos was with us and a lot of people to discuss research at the K-12 level. Um, and some of these uh, popped out of it as well. So we, we feel like that um, you can't, it can't be um, a Googleable project at all. And it needs to be original to the participants, but we don't necessarily think that the research needs to be original research um, as defined by, you know, scientists or engineers. Um, and so uh, just for your uh, reading pleasure here, this group of folks that got together back in, um, back in the spring developed a um, definition for research at the K-12 student level. And you can see there that it is uh, 
involves an extended open-ended investigation of a question um, and that the question and the approaches and the results are original to them. Um, and in fact, we don't even uh, start with original questions that they come up with, we provide them with questions. So it's a slightly different definition for research than maybe it would be for a scientist or an engineer uh, that's out there, but um, it, it works. And I think I can prove that to you as I move along here. So the um, first project that I want to tell you about is called Radio Astronomer for a Day. And this is our shortest sitcom version of, of our programming where school groups come and spend the night and they learn how to use this little telescope that you see down in the bottom of the slide. Um, they're taught how to use it. It's analog. So you flip switches and turn knobs and they're given a research problem which might be um, you're going to investigate the Milky Way galaxy and look um, uh, for signals from hydrogen atoms. And from there, they define the project for themselves and collect their own data. And then the next day, we debrief on this data they've collected together. So that is the sitcom version of um, uh, projects we do a lot where the students find that it's original to them. Um, we do a two-week immersion camp, uh, we call it an institute for students as they're transitioning between middle to high school, um, wherein students uh, are given these research problems and spend uh, a lot of their two weeks collecting data, devising their own observing strategies, devising their next questions and so on. And at the end of that two weeks, they report um, on their work at a colloquium and they produce a poster to hang in our, in our building as well. They have near, but not near peer mentors. These are 14 year old kids. So their mentors are college undergraduate students um, that we recruit for these two week camps that we do. And then they also have a scientist mentor that's a staff scientist here at Green Bank Observatory. So these camps are really full of wonderful experiences, but research, this research, these research projects are at the core and the students work in about teams of four to five students on different a problem statements. These are these um, sort of prompts that we give them to start, kickstart their research. We've been doing these sorts of things since um, uh, 1987, first with teachers and now directly with students. Now, another uh, tactic that we use is uh, for high school students and undergraduate students, and this, this is analyzing archive data. So we're it is original research in this sense that these data have not been seen before. And they're working with data collected by our big telescope at, under the auspices of a large consortium of astronomers to um, discover new pulsars, which are really cool objects that emit radio waves. Um, now I posted a picture of the kind of data that they analyze there on the left, and these students literally analyze, have analyzed millions of plots like this over the course of this project. So this is original research, but um, there's not a lot of creativity involved in that you uh, learn how to be a good data analyst and then you get access to these data uh, to help, um, you know, um, uh, go through a lot of data that needs to be needs to be seen and graded essentially. Um, students have made discoveries though as part of this, which is one of the big motivators for it. And this is a hybrid project, it's national. So we start out with um, uh, students uh, going through a, a web series, sort of a course, if you will, to become certified. They have access to the data after that. And those who um, are keen enough uh, and do enough data analysis can meet together face-to-face -face in a capstone um, project where we introduce them to uh, things like what it's like to be in college. So we usually ha have that at WVU. And then the um, final kind of project that we do with students is with students as they transition from um, high school to undergraduate school. And this is part of a, an NSF funded uh, program called INCLUDES. And um, here you see some students engaged in an engineering project to try to create 
um, telescopes, radio telescopes that could be used in a uh, classroom setting or an undergraduate setting, and they're testing uh, different designs and um, coding um, software to make them work. So this is a two week uh, immersion program for students right before they go to uh, college. So, um, you know, we've been doing this for a really long time. We, we find value in it. And, and the question really is always, does this work and what does it do? And I wanna go back to the persistence framework here and talk a little bit more about that. Um, we are um, not necessarily measuring um, whether or not students that participate in any one of these programs end up being a STEM person later on. What we do is do pre post surveys um, right there in the short term uh, around their experience and then a follow up um, survey with some of these students later. But what we're doing here is trying to um, um, employ already uh, researched high impact practices, which um, you know are well well researched already, like the fact that doing research early on is a great way to motivate you to persist through to the end of your um, STEM pathway and end up with a degree. And so the um, analysis that we do, and I've got two links right there. Hopefully, this slide deck is going to end up in the in the materials. And one of them is an evaluation example from 20 plus years of the K-12 projects we've been doing. Um, we use the same instrument every time. And so we have really consistent results that these programs increase students' science identity, their career interest in STEM, and their confidence. And we think that this is a critical juncture before they get to high school for, these, um, for this boost to happen to aid them in persisting. At the pre-undergraduate level, um, we not only uh, measure our Green Bank Observatory immersion program, but several others going around the state. And I've included a link to that student survey right there. But uh, not only do we see um, significant changes in STEM identity, in self-efficacy, and in research skills, but we also follow up with these students and we do see um, a correlation with their persistence as a STEM uh, major uh, beyond their, their first two semesters of college. And that's key, right? If we're building a workforce pipeline, we want to have them persist through and get that degree so they can join the STEM workforce. Um, so that's what we're up to here. And just anecdotally of the 30 folks here at Green Bank Observatory who, who are either engineers, software, or scientists, five hires in the last two years um, specified that they uh, wanted to work here because they had um, had an experience at Green Bank Observatory earlier on in their, in their journey. And so that's a successful pipeline when we can hire folks here that we need to hire. Um, we think it's successful. So that's what I wanted to tell you about just really, really quickly there. I'm gonna leave it there so that you can ask some questions. Thank you. Sue Ann, and, and, and that's great. And the, uh, the workshop that was held there earlier this spring to look at the um, research, uh, student research and its impacts, I'm reminded that I probably owe you some writing at, at some point here soon. <laughs> and, uh, but it was a great workshop and a really, really interesting discussion. Uh, we've got a, a little bit of time here and I'm gonna take five minutes of that uh, to show a quick video that is actually a new project uh, that, well, it's a project we've been working on for the past couple of years to actually um, introduce big science to the general public and to students to really inspire them to think about how lots of people contribute to making big science happen. It's not just the PhD scientists, it's all of the technicians, it's the engineers, it's all of these individuals 
uh, who can actually tap into and work at these facilities to keep them operational. And so that's a way to get the public to connect to big science. And in this program, we have been highlighting, our, our attempt is to highlight NSF large facilities. And we've been going after some ASIL uh, money, informal uh, STEM learning. We've not been successful yet, but we will be doing one last attempt at that with this effort uh, coming up uh, for the January presentation. So are you queued up? Okay, this is a sizzle reel for Green Bank Observatory that we put together that kind of gets you to think about what this might look like as a new TV series, which is the focus. So. <laughs> quietest town in America. We are a radio quiet as about any place that you can find. We're different in radio astronomy than optical astronomy. Isolation is very, very important. There's no Wi-Fi. There's uh, no microwaves allowed. People don't have cell phones. In a world that continuously wants to John Wayne it, isolation means that your neighbor is not a threat to you. They're an asset for your survival. It's a constant interplay for us between being as radio quiet as possible here and actually just trying to exist. You know, frankly, you have to want to live in Green Bank to work in Green Bank. I'm Mike Holstein and I'm the business manager for the Green Bank Observatory. Maintenance Day on the telescope, it's a highly scheduled event, of course. Observational efficiency is very important to us. My name is Sarah Stanfield. I work on an instrument called Mustang on the Green Bank Telescope. Mustang is basically a really big camera. We go out and we take detailed images of these big, beautiful galaxy clusters. We are up on the GBT. We have a bunch of maintenance work, things we need to fix up. I'm Karen O'Neill, and I'm the director of Green Bank Observatory. Mustang 2 is an incredibly sensitive instrument, and as we find for a lot of these sensitive instruments, it's really a challenging instrument to build, and it's a challenging instrument to maintain. It takes a whole team, a lot of people, in order to make a project like this happen. I'm Priscilla Grimes. I was born and raised here, actually. I love it here. I like the simple life. I don't like the commotion and the phones buzzing all the time. And just, you take a deep breath back and you get to see what you know, the world actually is. But I am also am a machinist and a welder. I have thought about all the pieces that I've made for the Mustang. You know, you're curious of where at on the telescope does it go. The folks that do the painting are a special breed for sure. There are parts of the structure that, depending on its orientation, stand about 485 feet above ground level. The best office space in the world. The backup structure is composed of very thin wall tubes. A big challenge with Mustang 2 is that we have very limited access physically to the camera. So if there's a problem, we may only have one day a week that we can tinker around and try and actually find out what's wrong with it. Okay, are we gonna remember how everything goes back together? My name is Amanda Wichterman and I'm a telescope operator. Driving mostly involves using a computer, the touch of a button or the click of a mouse. At the end of maintenance days, we get to drive it in an extra special way. In that moment, not only are you driving 17 million pounds, but you're doing so with these little dials, just like you see on TV. It's an incredible feeling, and you feel the rumble of the, the GBT under your feet, and it's my favorite part of being an operator. <laughs> you know, what kid hasn't walked outside and seen the stars and just wondered, wondered about your place in the world, wondered how we got here. 
As a telescope operator, it would be pretty awesome. While you were on shift, a signal was received that has been identified as intelligent life from outer space. And this is a fairly common question in our community, right? If we believe in an infinitely creative God, I don't know that he's bound to only create this one thing that we can observe from here. I have thought about you know, if there's life out there, and I think there is. I mean, there, there can't be just us out there floating around in the world, you know? The challenge that I think about is whether or not we currently have enough resources, both the funding and the folks that make it happen, in order to keep this place going today, this year, next year, and so forth. People's jobs are at stake to keep this thing running. To me, big science means really trying to understand our place within the universe. Big science is making new discoveries. Big science is really any science that has a big impact. When I think of big science, I think there is hope. Big science is a lifestyle. It's an attitude. OK. Um, <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Uh, hopefully, maybe in the next um, year to two years or so, the, the first episode might get released and uh, we have a new TV series that will uh, beat out uh, some of the other ones that are some of the other reality TV stuff that is not nearly worth your time. Uh, so we have some time for questions here uh, from whether in the room or virtually. Any questions for any of the presenters? Okay, back here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This is a question for everyone. Um, are any of these funded through the large facilities themselves, the programs themselves? Or are all these done on supplemental, um, additional grants, cooperative agreements, et cetera? Great question. Um, John, we'll start with you and then we'll go to the folks who are virtual. Sure. Real quickly, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, this was funded by NSF ITEST program. Now, to say that, we also have uh, mentors that are funded through the facilities. Uh, we have the infrastructure of our staff that are funded through the facilities and we leverage uh, work that we've done, curriculum materials, et cetera, from, from the facilities. So, the research itself and the work that we're doing to test our model is funded through iTest, but we build on other resources as well. Uh, Sue Ann, Carlos, or uh, Valerie? I'll go first. There's one. So um, uh, one of our camps for 14-year-olds uh, is um, uh, really targeted at um, students who are historically underserved in STEM. And uh, it's for about 25 students and we fund it through, you know, our normal operating funds through the cooperative agreement, but the rest of them are funded through external funds. Yeah, all of our programs are uh, wrapped into the NSF for grant as well. Uh, we do occasionally get some additional money for, um, for instance, Sci Girls, which is a national organization, but is also NSF funded. Um, but all that goes to materials for the campers, t-shirts and things like that. All of ours are also externally funded. Um, most of our funding comes from NSF, but we also, for the ham radio, it was funded by the Amateur Ham Radio Association. Hey, thank you. Other questions? This is for uh, Carlos. Uh, I love the example that you gave that sort of drew the bright line between somebody coming to a camp and being a PhD candidate. I'm curious, how do you have a method or how you got that example? And are, are you actively collecting examples like that? Because I think that it's one of the hardest things to do is to be able to show uh, in the STEM field, someone at a young age doing something and, and where they actually end up. So like, I'd love to hear how you did that and how we can replicate it. No, it is absolutely the hardest thing to try and track those students is from middle school because their middle school email address just doesn't always translate to their high school and undergraduate careers. So it is very difficult, um, but occasionally we get lucky with a, a student who has been so involved at the Mag Lab that we're able to um, continue to hear back. We, we send out emails. Um, I believe every year or every other year to uh, the alumni of our programs asking them, where are you? What are you up to? What are you doing? 
Um, also, we try and bring back as many as role models to highlight. In, for instance, in the summer camps, Mati McKinney was able to come back as a role model for the Sci Girls summer camp and talk about her path and how this, the, um, the, the Sci Girls summer camp helped influence her to become where she is today. So it's not an easy task. Um, it is definitely very difficult. I will say this, occasionally social media can be your friends. So that's one of those things too. Hi, <laughs> thanks for your presentation. They were really interesting. I'm wondering what the best practices are for introducing um, undergraduates and younger students to careers. So one of you presented a web-based exploration of, of career types. And um, I'm wondering if that's essentially effective because there are lots of ways to search on the web for careers. And um, I don't know about that. And then on the other hand, you know, in a, in a perfect world, I suppose you'd introduce students to all kinds of careers, you know, in their summer camps and and stuff, but that, of course, is probably not feasible. So what's shown to be the most effective in the education world and as a, a feasible approach that works? We'll go to the folks virtually first. Any comment? Well, I can say that um, I, I was the one wanting to come up with like a web-based database of careers. And honestly, it's not the most effective way. Um, it reaches the most people. That's the thing about the web is you can reach people who are not in your media area. Um, so you have a broader reach. I've um, just come out of an educational program uh, for, and I found that it is the best and most effective way is to do, is to build relationships. However, building relationships, I mean, that takes a lot of effort, both on the part of the, the people who are in the professions um, and the people who are you know, log logistically guiding that relationship. So I just find that it's difficult. Um, I don't know what anyone else here would think about that. I'd like to add that um, using role models is a great way because it, um, it personifies the career. So instead of reading about astrophysicists, they've met an astrophysicist and they've got some connections to an individual. Um, that individual has hobbies. They look like me. Um, so, so I use role models whenever possible. There's also a great activity for high school students from Step Up um, called Career in Physics. You can find that on the website, on their website. Um, and that's a, a really, really good activity um, to, to highlight different uh, non-traditional careers in physics. Carlos, I was just going to say step up because they just show you all the kinds of careers that use physics and why physics is cool. And they really go outside of the box for that. The other thing that we have tried are sort of career panels, both virtual ones with undergrads, though, so that they can tell you also like what's fun about being a, a STEM major and what they're doing um, so that students see um, somebody close to their age that might be pursuing a career in the future. Sometimes the virtual things, though, they're, they're not all that well attended unless they're part of a big like statewide. It is career week um, in West Virginia. They have that right before the FAFSA needs to be filled out. And so we participate in things like that, too, just to introduce the careers here at the observatory. Okay, thanks, Sue Ann. And we are we're out of time. But I think one of the big themes that uh, really rings true here is um, this mentorship idea, uh, getting kids exposed to career opportunities through mentors so that they can see people experience people interact with people that they can one day become. And I think that that is something that's that's really critical. And when we look at the workforce at the at the you know, large facilities, mid-scale facilities, there is tremendous opportunity there for, for mentorship. And I think having the facilities find ways to encourage and support their, in their workforce to actually serve as mentors for up and coming next generation STEM professionals is, is critical. So we will stop there. It is break time. There's, I'm told there's cookies and coffee and everything else out there. So back here at uh, 1030 uh, for leveraging communications and outreach across facilities, which is another great uh, presentation. So thank you.